just a couple of more words about me. So I am a STEM professor at Polytechnic di Torino, Italy. Uh, my area of expertise is in computer engineering, but I've also a background in electronics and telecommunication and a master in mathematics engineering. This is uh, some of the universities and companies I cooperated and collaborated with in the last uh, five years. So today I'm gonna present you in this lecture a bit of the motivation. Why do we need to uh, respect privacy? And why as engineers that manage data and perform machine learning, federated learning needs to care about privacy. Uh, then the specific problem of anonymization and the techniques related to anonymization of data or to answers of queries to data. And the main techniques I will briefly present, because we have a short lecture, are canonymity and its variants that are uh, used a lot in the industry. And then a little bit of more mathematical properties that guarantees privacy. And I will need introduce differential privacy. And I know that Professor Alex will have a post lecture specific on that on the next week or two weeks. And finally, uh, in the presentation, there are also some tools for anonymization. Here we don't have time to practice a bit, but I'll leave the slides uh, that Professor Jung will share. And so you can take a look also at what are the practical tools, programming tools that you can use in Python or other programming languages to perform this kind of anonymization on data. So first, 10 minutes introduction so on why we need anonymization. So nowadays, we have big data everywhere. And big data is generated uh, in different ways. User uh, generated content on the internet. These might be explicit uh, generated content, like I don't know, some post on Facebook, or maybe also implicit, just visiting some website is some already some information that a user is generating even without explicitly writing something. Uh, we have health and scientific computing. We have log files from networking, from computers. And in general, we have Internet of Things. So, well, why the first one is clearly uh, concerning some individual, but also the other might concern some individuals and so might threaten their privacy. To, just to be sure, let's make an example of a service that may, everybody nowadays use. It's like real-time traffic information on how, and how to select one route or the other. These service can be performed because uh, data about uh, your speed in your car on by walking or on the metro is collected through the services. So this is called crowdsourcing data. Then you have other information, you compute something, and you have the output. So in order to know the real-time traffic information, actually, there are data generated from human beings, so individual entities. So even to provide this service, privacy can be really, really important. Let's suppose that you have a street that it's a very unpopular street, and maybe you are the only one that uses this street. So Google and also the users of Google might know if maybe if you are on the street or you are not in the street, in theory. And who is collecting this data on the internet? Yes, we have uh, all kinds of entities that are collecting data about users on the internet from online shops to search engines, navigation systems, but also internet service providers, so even the who is providing you the, the access to the internet and not really a web service is collecting information because the ISP through the network knows on we, which website you are and maybe knows even more about you because you're paying it. So you have, you have your credit card number, your address, et cetera. And then finally, basically almost all website through tracking, even though nowadays tracking is starting being banned from different browsers, still there's tracking for advertisement. So with this big data comes also a big problem. And the big problem is that a lot of this information are generated by us. We are human beings, and so this data might threaten our privacy. Now, let me say a couple of slides about what is privacy, because we're keeping saying privacy and privacy. So there's a different privacy perception if you speak to different uh, entities. So if you speak to, to industry, maybe for them, privacy is something annoying because they need to respect some rules. 
if you speak to computer scientists, they will say that it's a confidentiality of data. If you speak to sociologists, they will say that it's a fundamental human right. If you speak to lawyers, they will say that it's compliance to some laws. So the perspective might change. Coming back to the very old definition, the first time there's the word privacy used in a context as we, as we mean nowadays is from the pamphlet, the right to privacy from Samuel Warren and Luis Brande. And for them, basically it was the right to be left alone, not to be bothered. Uh, a, most, uh, a, most, a more recent definition is the one from Alan Westin that it says that it's very similar to the laws that are nowadays in the European Union, is the right to control, edit, manage, and delete information about themselves and decide when, how, and to what extent information is communicated to others. These principles are taken and expanded in the uh, European General Data Protection Law. So, let me go directly to this slide. This is the uh, current law uh, for European citizens, also outside of Europe, so worldwide. And it's it, it entered in force in May 2019, so it's already six years. And the goal is to protect the user privacy and punish the violation. So first, it defines what are the personal data. And personal data are any information which are related to an identified or identifiable natural person. We are going to dig into the word identifiable. Uh, identifiers what are, well, name, name and surname, uh, your, your email, your phone, basically is a feature that uniquely identify you. So there is only you with your phone number. There is only you with your email address. Maybe not with name and surname, but there are going to be maybe a lot of people with the exact name and surname. Other things are special characteristics, so also genetic, mental, cultural information. So the principle of the GDPR are accountability. So you need to be responsible and adopt a safe behavior and document it. You mean who is treating your data, who is accessing your data. So it might be you as a researcher, might be you as a company, might be you as a as a as the state as well. Secondly, is privacy by design. So you need to assess the privacy impact before data process. So you cannot, uh, let's say, adding your data in your server. You cannot use your data on your server if you, if nobody if before collecting you did a privacy uh, uh, impact. So will this data impact some individuals or some groups of individuals? Third thing is privacy by default. So even if you did already a, mm -hmm. uh, a privacy assessment impact, you cannot just collect data because maybe one day in the future you'll need it. You need to collect data if you have a purpose. And the purpose must be uh, communicated with the user. And we need an explicit concept of the user to use this data for this specific uh, objective. So that's, that's really important also for us as scientists, because we used to, if we can collect a lot of data, because maybe we're going to need an experiment two years from now in another research. This is no more possible. So I'm working a lot also with online social networks. And you can still collect data about online social networks, but you need to know exactly for which reason you are collecting this data. And then once you publish the paper, you should delete the data, or at least have a expiry date for when you are deleting the data. You cannot just keep it in the server forever. And finally, transparency. So you need to transmit in a simple way, in a clear way, all the information about which data company a scientist has about an individual, and possibly remove the data if the user is not willing anymore to provide the consent for the usage of this data. And moreover, if there are data breaches, because we are not in a perfect world, even if we are protecting data, there might be some, some hackers, some data leakage. These should be, uh, let's say, you cannot hide that, that someone entered in your system. If you know that you, the data has been leaked, you have to say it. If not, you are, 
you can have a fine or incriminating for that. So given this introduction, still we need sometimes to publish or even just transmit to a third party the data that we have. And so we need to take care that this data is somehow anonymous. Anonymous means that there is, there is no personal data of individual that can be re-identified. However, it's, it's harder than it appears. And let me do some examples. Because to perform anonymization is not enough to remove identifying information. It is called pseudo-anonymization. Why is not enough? Let, let me do a very, very popular example, even though it's, it's quite old. So in 1997, the Massachusetts Group Insurance Commission released anonymized, pseudonymized data on state employees that showed every single hospital visit. And this is published for researchers to do some medical analysis, some statistical medical analysis. And they remove, of course, the identifiers. So the name, the address, and the social security number were removed. However, a researcher purchased the voter roll from Cambridge, basically it's just a database on all the citizens of Cambridge and with name, address, zip code, birth date, and sex. And what she did, she combined the two data sets and was able to discover all the hospital visits of the governor of Massachusetts. Well, why? Because only six, peers, six people in the same city shared his birth date, only three of them were men, and just only one of them living in zip code. So this is a, a clear case in which data was released pseudo-anonymized, but then actually it's not completely anonymized. You can still reconstruct and say who is who, or at least someone, catch if someone is missing there. Another example that I want to show is the one of, of Netflix. So Netflix made this uh, huge competition in 2006, uh, providing uh, $1 million to whoever scientist was improving by 10% the, uh, the, the performances of their um, recommendation algorithm. And so they released 100 million ratings. Uh, previously, Netflix, you, you could rate from one to five each movie. Now, nowadays, I think you cannot anymore. Uh, and so you had basically half a million users with an average of 200 ratings. And they anonymize this information, the information of the user. So they don't provide you the name and surname, they just provide you uh, an ID, uh, uh, an integer number. Again, a researcher similar to what the example of Massachusetts medical data, take another data set, in this case, the IMB data set, where there are users, often with the name and surname, that are providing, again, votes and comments on, on movies. And what the researchers do, did, they try to combine the two databases. So the anonymized Netflix data. So we have like a matrix where rows are users and columns are movies. And from public data, it is IMDB public. So where you have, again, rows where are movies, sorry, um, users and columns which are movies. And by combining them, they were able to reconstruct not all of them, but many users. Why is this a problem? This is a problem because some users um, mm -hmm. on some public uh, database like IMDb, they don't want maybe to comment on some, uh, on some movies because they don't want other people to know that they watch some, some kind of movies. Why on Netflix data, they have the world data. So they were able to discover that some people were with a very, very high likelihood, the same people in two databases, but also they were able to say which movies they did not comment on IMDb. And there are many other examples of attacks here. I will not uh, cover them. There's uh, also some list of it. The important thing of this first part is that you cannot always anonymize data simply by removing the identifiers. And often, the most vulnerable part is that if the attacker has another database that cannot that can merge. And a priori, when you publish some data, you don't know that available to other people. 
So you cannot try to combine with all the other available data sets in the world and be sure that this data cannot be, uh, the individual data cannot be recovered. You don't have this information. And this leads to, okay, so how can we try to ensure, or at least ensure with some degree of certainty, the fact that the data that we publish or the statistics that we publish are anonymous. So we perform privacy preserving techniques. The first one that I'm gonna present is canonymity. So the terminology of canonymity, you have personal data attributes, and these are things like name, home address, phone number, email address, age, and biometrics. Uh, other kind of personal data can also be whatever it's ready to you. So the, IP, the IP address that can be used somehow to characterize you, the MAC address of, of some sensors, GPS positions, uh, what you wrote, et cetera. These are all personal data attributes, can be seen as features. And you split these informations in the identifiers. So identifiers, as I said, are those features that directly identifies the person. But you also have quasi-identifiers. So quasi-identifiers, the features taken by itself is not enough to identify you, but if correlated with other features, other data, can in theory uh, be used to link that row with a specific user. And finally, you have sensitive attributes. So sensitive attributes are those attributes, those features that you don't want to be linked with a certain specific person. So for example, the physical condition, social condition, sexual orientation, all this kind of stuff. And these are a bit uh, arbitrary. So for example, you might say that also your, uh, uh, I don't know, your date of birth is sensitive for someone or someone is not. So let's make this example on, on, on some on a table similar to the one uh, of the Massachusetts uh, example. So in this case, you have the identifier, also Coquil can be the name. Yeah, I didn't write the surname, but it's name plus surname. Quasi identifier, something like date of birth, gender and zip code, and sensitive attributes can be the disease. And I'm gonna use this example to show you canonymity in Spark. So let's see canonymity. So the idea is that a data set that is published or transferred to another party, uh, the information for a row cannot be distinguished from at least k minus one other rows. So for example, if you try to identify a person in the list that table, so this table without the keys, without the identifiers, there must be at least k rows with the same birth date, zip, uh, and gender, so that you cannot infer the disease of the person. So if you're used to SQL language, uh, what you need to check, you need to check that if there is table T, you count uh, how many for each combination of quasi identifiers. So you group by each uh, combination of quasi identifier, you, you, you count how many elements you have, and for each group, the, this number should be at least K, larger than K. And K is a parameter, and of course, it indicates the degree of anonymity. If k is one, then you don't have anonymity. If k is infinite, then of course you, you will have infinite rows, infinite data points that are close to, that are the same exact combination of quasi identifiers. Uh, how do you achieve k anonymity? Because our set cannot, maybe it's not k anonymous, but you, in order to release, you need to, trans, to transform the table the results in order to be k anonymous. And you have different, there are different algorithms. And the idea is always that either you generalize some feature, some column, or you modify some columns 
so you change the feature, or you suppress, so you delete some columns or rows from it. And you do this until the release data is k anonymous. If the, the, the data was already originally k anonymous, that's perfect for you. So let me just show an example of generalization. So in this case, it means uh, to replace the quasi identifiers with uh, some less specific, but with a, at least with a semantic in it. Uh, so for example, the zip code, it is a semantic. So it's not like a, a, a completely random number. The first row, the first uh, digits are showing you the macro area and the final digit is showing the very specific area where you live. Same thing for the second feature, the age. The first digit means that you are in your 20s. In that case, the second digit is the exact, uh, your exact age. So you can generalize this, for example, by removing the less important digit. You need to have a semantic. If not, if it's completely random number, you cannot generalize. And so in this example, that is still the, the, the previous table, we reach a uh, k anonymity with k equal to two just by removing the last digit of the zip code. So if you check for each combination of the four, of the four, the first four features, you have at least two individuals, two data points, two rows with the same uh, quasi identifiers. So if you have an external data, like those, this one, this table on the right, and you know that uh, there's a, a person with that, that bird, the gender, zip code, and race, you can uh, try to link with the first one, but then you don't know if, first you don't know if it's in the data, but also you don't know if it has chest pain, obesity, or short breath problem. How does the algorithm for generalization work? Well, first of all, there are many different algorithms that do generalization. But the problem is not easy at all. Actually, it is an NPR problem because you want to obtain the minimum possible information loss that uh, still uh, is uh, providing you at least two points. So basically, you need to segment to split your data space here there are just two features age and uh, and zip code you want to to, to divide this uh, multi-dimensional space into groups and the groups the space the, the, the region should have at least k elements like in this case the one to the right two elements in each but you should lose the, the you should lose the least possible information so basically, the information is given by what? But how much you are aggregating? So how much the uh, space is uh, large? So you want to divide into groups that are possibly narrow in space, but vary with a very large number of elements. So you can do this density-based. You can do this uh, in a different way. But in general, the problem is NPR. And there are different algorithms to to, to try to heuristically and non heuristically solve this problem. OK, and this is generalization. There are then other techniques like modification or suppression, so remove uh, cases. Uh, one important thing that is true for canonymity, but what, with whatever uh, algorithms that is trying to, per, to anonymize data, is that you cannot have complete privacy 100% privacy and 100% utility at the same time. So you cannot uh, have all the information in the original data with all the possible privacy. Because also with generalization, you are you're having some information loss. You don't know anymore the exact specific zip code and the exact specific age in the example. So there's always these kind of shapes and hopefully, what we want to reach is we want to reach this point, 100%. Uh, no, sorry, you cannot see the mouse. Yeah. You want to reach 100% utility and privacy. You can't. So you need to move on this curve. 
And this curve depends on the algorithm. So hopefully you want to find an algorithm that it's pushing this curve towards this 100% and 100%, but we'll never be able to reach 100% of both of them. So how do you find the number, how do you tune the parameter K? That's depend on a lot of things, depend on number of records, depend on number of quasi identifiers, on the distribution and relationship. So it's not that easy. Uh, but there's a lot of time, as I said, if you choose a very high K, that means that you have a larger privacy instead, uh, but, but also lower utility. One thing that you should keep in mind is the curves of dimensionality. So these algorithms based on generalization uh, relies on special locality. So you need to have many data samples that are close in space. Well, you should have a, at least a certain density, not to remove too much information. However, uh, when the number of features increases, when the number of attributes increases, also the, uh, the, your space will become naturally more sparse. So points will be scattered around in, uh, when you have many dimensions. In the example of Netflix, uh, you could have uh, as many dimensions and the number of movies. In that case, in that set were 70,000. Or you can have also other data sets where you can have even millions of dimensions. So your nearest neighbors will likely become farther from you. So your space will become more and more sparse. And so you cannot really find easily dense region of the space. And so when you generalize, when you have a lot of, a lot of dimension, what happens is that basically your data set might become useless because you, are, you need to generalize too much to find a dense region of the space. So keep this in mind. Uh, is there like a chat as well? I see that there's... Ah, okay, no, it's your question. Me, okay, it's you. Yeah, if you have some questions, just interrupt me. There are not too, too many, so don't worry to stop me. So it's K anonymity uh, perfect? No, it's not at all. There are a lot of different possible of attacks. I'm going to present you uh, one, maybe two of them, and how you can try to still modify it. So why is K anonymity so popular? Because it's very easy. It's a very easy concept. And these algorithms work pretty well, not because it's the safest thing to do. So uh, k anonymity does not provide privacy if your sensitive values lacks diversity and if the attacker has background knowledge. Let me show what I mean. So this data set on the right, you have that it's a tree anonymous, so k equal to three. So you have at least three people, three, three rows, with the same deep code and age. Deep code and age are the quasi identifiers. And this is instead uh, is our sensitive attribute. So now we know that Bob lives in this uh, zip code and has this age. And what you can do, you can try to link it with your three anonymous uh, data set. And what you obtain, see, is that still you know exactly that he has a heart disease because the sensitive attribute lacks diversity. So you have three people, but all of them with the same sensitive attribute. So you can infer that if it's in the data set, then this person, Bob, has heart disease. And another thing is background knowledge attack. Again, you don't know what the attacker knows. So the attacker might know that this person, Carl, does not have heart disease. So in this case, he's go with this deep code with this age, so here we have, we have diversity. We have two different um, sensitive attributes, sensitive uh, attribute values. But since the attacker knows that Carl doesn't have any heart disease, the attacker can say that uh, Carl has cancer. So for this problem, one solution can be L diversity. And L diversity is means that we don't just have to guarantee that the dataset is k-anonymous, but also that the 
sensitive attributes are diverse because k anonymity is working on fuzz identifiers, not on the sensitive attributes. So we need to have well represented sensitive values. So in this case, we have two groups. So this data set is six anonymous. Uh, moreover, the disease, if you see there are different, the distribution of diseases is not spike on a single disease, but it's quite, it has different values. Uh, there are different ways to ensure L diversity, different algorithms. You might want just to have at least L distinct values. You might have a probabilistic approach where you just want that the frequency of the most frequent value is not too much. Or when you, you, you want to ensure that the, the entropy, uh, it's uh, at least a function of your L, like in this case, logarithm of L. Is L diversity enough? No, it's not again. Why? Because if we have an original data set where, as in this case, your sensitive attribute is if you are HIV positive or negative, and in this data set, 99% are actually HIV negative, so just 1% is HIV positive, and you create a group of quasi identifier that is uh, K anonymous. And this group, the one in green above, has that 50% are uh, HIV positive. So this group is still diverse. There are many H HIV positive, many HIV positive. However, this still leaks out a lot of information because then you can probabilistically say that your uh, the person that is in this group is much more likely to be HIV positive than from the original data. Well, in this in the second case where you still have the same proportion, even if, though it's not diverse according to some L diversity definition. In that case, we'll not leak anything. Its distribution is equal. So let me go a little bit fast. The fact is that we can have a lot of different attacks to these uh, techniques, and you can start, still try to tune it a bit and try to add more uh, uh, more changes algorithm that take into consideration all distribution. Uh, the only problem is that after a while, if you try to avoid, let me go directly to what I wanted to show, you might want to obtain something that is complete anonymous, so you cannot probabilistically say anything about the original data uh, from the quasi identifier and the distribution of the sensitive uh, attribute. However, if you cannot uh, say anything, that means that then this data set will not be used, useful at all. So the original idea was to use data to find correlation between uh, quasi identifiers and the disease. If you try to break those co that correlation, then why are you publishing the data? You want to perform statistical analysis, so you want to keep some correlation between features. So to, to end this first part about canonymity, uh, canonymity focus on the transformation. So taking your data that you want to publish, you want to transfer to a third party and to, want to make sure that it's anonymous. You remove the identifiers. You make sure that the quasi identifier are K anonymous. So there's at least K minus one other elements in the dataset with the same quasi identifier. Then you can perform other modification like L diversity. There's another one, T closeness that is in the slide, but I skip it because we don't have time. Uh, to be sure that they also the information from the sensitive attribute is not leaked. 
The problem is that we don't know what the attacker knows and what the attacker doesn't. So we just need to make assumption on the data that we have, so on the quasi-identifier and sensitive attributes. So what can we do if we don't know what the attacker knows? And this comes differential privacy. So I want to show you at least the idea of differential privacy uh, and to see what, why it's, it's more mathematically sounding than k-anonymity, even though uh, might be a little bit more complex to explain, especially to companies, and also then to understand how much you are losing in terms of information. So as I said, anonymization is there because you don't know what the attacker knows, the knowledge, but also you don't know exactly what are the capabilities of the attackers. You don't know which kind of uh, techniques will become available from five years from now. But once you publish the data, that is published forever. At least someone will have it somewhere. So you need to, to be robust against future data set, future techniques, and future computational power. So differential privacy is providing you a guarantee on a quantifiable privacy. So it quantifies the privacy, the amount of privacy. And so it's giving, it's giving you some probabilistic guarantees. And it's very nice because it's resilient not only to known attack, but also to a known attack. So the idea, so the, this started in 2006 from Cinzia work, uh, Cinzia work, uh, work, but also he has early roots from the 1960 where this idea that I will present you of adding noise was already present. So the idea of differential privacy is actually a smart idea because when you're publishing data, usually we don't, we want to not really to show uh, who is participating. We want to generalize some information. And differential privacy is ensuring that there is no way to say, to be sure that someone participate or didn't participate in the data collection. So basically, the outcome, the answers of your analysis will be equal or almost equal, whether the individual will join or will not join. This is, is actually similar to the concept of machine learning, where you want to generalize your, uh, your algorithm. So when you have your training data, you want to create a model that works on new data points. You don't, work, you don't want algorithms that work only on those data points. And so if you remove a single data point or add a single data point, your algorithm should not change too much hopefully not change at all. Because if you change a lot, it means that it's overfitting to that specific data, that specific data points, the single row. In this case, we're talking about individuals, so the specific individual. So if you want to perform a statistical analysis, machine learning, you want to, to extract a machine learning model, you want to generalize, and so you don't want your output to depend on a single entry. And that's perfect, because that's also compatible with anonymity. We want data to be anonymous. So we don't want it to be dependent on one single entry. So in differential privacy, uh, the scenario is that we expect the worst. So we assume that the attacker knows everything. So we don't divide anymore in sensitive, quasi-identified. The attacker knows everything about the data. The only things that doesn't know if it's a, a, sp a specific user is or isn't in the data collection. So all the features are known of all individuals in the world by the attacker. So what the attacker can do is, well, OK, access that set, but we'll try to limit for now to just performing queries. So asking some uh, uh, function of the rows to the to the data set, the creator or whatever. And from the answer, the attacker that knows everything shouldn't be able to assess if an user is or isn't in the data. 
So let me show you an example with this data. So we have three rows, three Q people, Amir, Esteban, and Shin, and we have, they have three different dates, 1.75 meters, 1.73, and 1.76. So a function of this, this line can be the average, and the average is 1.71 meters. And let's take this second data set that is exactly equal to the first one, but there's also Luca inside. And Luca is 1.90. So the average will change. The function will change, 1.76. Now, we might be interested in the average age because we want to know the uh, statistical distribution of this population. The population should be big enough that it will not change too much if Luca is inside or not. In this case, there are only three lines, so we'll change a lot. So the attacker might ask exactly, what is the average eight of this data? And if the answer from the data set is 1.76, the attacker might say that, OK, so Luca is inside. Because there, if not, it would have been 1.71. What about instead if instead of returning the exact value, we adding some nodes? Noise can be positive or negative. So in that case, we can still say something. So if the output is 1.73, well, in this case, it's between 1.71 and 1.76. But even if it's a positive value, like 1.77, we still cannot say for sure if Luca is inside or not. If the answer is 1.77, we may, may be more likely Luca is inside. But you cannot say for sure. even if you know the uh, noise distribution. So the noise might be known to the attacker, the noise distribution of the exact value. So the basic setup is that we have a database, data set, table D, which might contain some information that we want, don't want to leak. The database curator has access to the full database. For now, we assume the creator is trusted, but there are also variants in which the creator is not trusted. And so you can do something like in a federated way in which there is not a centralized uh, trusted creator. Uh, you as a data analyst want, want to analyze the data, so perform statistical analysis. So you want to perform the queries, like know the average of a certain attribute. So. The curator will give you the answer by changing something, like adding the noise. This new function is called usually the mechanism. And we call two databases, the ND prime, to be neighbors if they are equal except for one single entry. Like in this case, these two tables are neighbors because they're just a single difference that is Luca. So we want to have a mechanism, this black box, that if you give this data, or you give the same data, but just with, uh, with a single different entry, so a neighborhood data, the output of the two of the same, of the black boxes of the two data set will be almost equal. So almost equal you measure by a distance in distribution and this distance should be as small as possible. So that's why I call it epsilon. So this is the idea. So have a black box that it's adding some noise so that the two distribution are very similar. Now, let me give you the formal definition. So your query mechanism M, so M is the black box here, is epsilon differentially private if for any two databases, D and D prime that are neighbor, here it's called adjacent, it's the same as neighbors. So any two. So it doesn't matter who is the line that you add, remove uh, any. Then, uh, considering a possible output of the mechanism C, C it's, an, it's a subset of all the output of the mechanism. So M basically is a function from the original data to M, to space M. 
and so, so here in the in the plot you have the x-axis is the is the output of your mechanism one dimensional but can be multi-dimensional and on the y-axis instead you have the probability since you, we are adding some noise with a certain probability and so basically the output of the mechanism of d and the output of the mechanism of d prime should be very close that means that if you change one element from d to d prime the output will be almost equal so we formalize what i said in work here the distribution should be at a distance less than epsilon and epsilon is here in uh, e to the power of epsilon and since d and d prime are exchangeable then you, you can also say that you can also put the probability and the prime belonging to C to the other side. And so basically it's it's not just upper bounded, but it's also lower bounded. So what we are saying is that the output should be not too far from the other. So basically the two lines here, the probability of response for uh, D and for the prime shouldn't be too far. So this area, the red area, whatever is C, it's limited by e to the power of epsilon, multiplied by the probability, of course. So here, the only parameter that we have is epsilon. So epsilon is an arbitrary parameter that we can choose. We can tune exactly as k in k anonymity. So if you choose low epsilon, the two quantities are forced to be similar. If you put epsilon equal to 0, then this probability is equal to the second probability. So actually, you have more privacy, because not only they are very similar, they are the same. So if you change one element, the output is exactly the same. So epsilon equal to 0, infinite privacy. If instead you have a high epsilon, then the two quantities are allowed to diverge. So basically, this upper bound will go to infinity, and the lower bound, if you do some math, will become minus infinity. But if epsilon goes to infinity, then you can just say, I don't know which is the probability. And so you have, in that case, of course, you have uh, uh, less privacy because the difference is unbounded. It can be completely different the two outputs. Even by changing a single line, the output are completely different. OK, so you have this parameter. However, not all the queries are the same. So some of them may be more intrusive, and some of them might be less intrusive. So basically, the output can have different shapes here, not just the distance is providing you the epsilon differentially privacy, but the shape of the curve is not given a priori. Depends on the on the query. So you can measure the privacy of a certain query by the uh, sensitivity. So basically, it's providing you an upper bound, the maximum, between the output of the, the real function, the one without the noise. So basically, we are performing, we are seeing how much far apart are two possible outputs. So if you have a higher global sensitivity, it means that the output, by just by changing a single element, will be large. If instead you have insensitive queries, that means that by changing a single element, the output will not be the same. So to make an example, the, is the average, the average as a low sensitivity? Actually, no, no, it's not true. It's not true. It's the, the average is not at a low sensitivity. Uh, if you take in the counting as a low sensitivity, because if you're, if you're counting how many elements you have in the data set, adding and removing one element will change the count by minus one or plus one. So this max will be one in the counting. So if in here, Instead of the average, I will ask, OK, how many elements do I have? And the answer is three and four. Clearly, 
the sensitivity is one because the difference can be one. The average, well, depends because in theory, uh, if the eight is unbounded, I can be told infinite. Then also the average is unbounded because if if I am uh, a user with an infinite height, then the average we might change from zero to plus infinite. Then in practice it's not true because if you know that the your height is bounded, I don't know between one meter and two meter, then clearly your average will just change maximum of one meter divided by the total number of elements on which you do the average. So depending on the query, different query might have different uh, uh, sensitivity. And you should be able to measure this global sensitivity to understand then how much noise you need to, to add. OK, so now let's see what is this perturbation, this noise that we should add. So a user. Uh, scientist or attacker will ask some metrics, some functions, some mapping of the original database, database, and the curator will return the correct answer plus some noise. And we want it to respect epsilon differential privacy with a certain specified epsilon, given that f of d has a certain global sensitivity. What is this noise that can be added? So there are different techniques, the most common one is the Laplace noise. So this is the most important theorem. So basically, your mechanism would be to have the real output f of x plus adding a Laplace noise that depends on global sensitivity and epsilon. Epsilon is chosen by the administrator. Global sensitivity, no. Global sensitivity depends on the query. And uh, I will not show you the, the proof, but just to give you a, an idea, the Laplacian noise has this kind of density centered around the, the, the real values. So you're adding a noise, more, more likely a very small noise and less likely a large noise. And here, epsilon is, is e to the power of epsilon. So if you do the logarithm, you'll find that the, the noise that you're adding independently of the value of epsilon will be always at the same distance. So this is just to give you an idea on how you can prove that this is a, uh, actually, the theorem is actually true. So properties of differential privacy, why it's so nice? Because then you can do a lot of things. For example, composability. So you can apply the sanitization many times and then you will lose some privacy, but you can really measure how much you are losing. And there's a theorem that will say that if you are, if you have two data that satisfy epsilon one and epsilon two differential, uh, are differentially private, then if you are combining them, then you're losing some, inform some privacy, uh, but this is bounded by the sum of the two epsilon. Actually, there's the theorem say, says it even it's proportional to the square root. And the nice thing is that you don't need to know anything about what the adversary knows or my knows, because any post-processing on this function will not be able to improve the knowledge. So there is no way to go back and remove somehow with that some future techniques this noise. The problem is that if you can perform the same quiz over and over again, at the end, you still be able to know the true values. Why? Because the added noise is Laplacian. So apply multiple times. So asking some query for the composability, you will lose each time a little bit of privacy up to the end where you, where you have, when you've done infinite queries, you can reconstruct the Laplacian noise around your true values, in this case, 30. So here, to build this Instagram, you need to perform hundreds of queries. And after these hundreds of queries, you, by maximum likelihood, you can say that the true, the original true value was 30. So 
what you what you will do to users that needs to perform queries is to perform to, to have a privacy budget. So you cannot repeat the same queries infinite times because then you will know the true value. And if you know the true value, then you, you can say if a user is or isn't in the data set. So usually you have a privacy budget and given the composability properties, you can choose whether to have perform a few queries that are providing you accurate answers or a lot of queries which provide you a more generalized and noisy answers. That's because epsilon for the composability properties basically will be the same to perform 10 queries with epsilon equal to one or one query with epsilon equal to 10. And so this is, this is managed by the user. Epsilon is provided by the curator you are a user, you have a budget of 10, and then you can choose how to how you want your outputs. Yeah, actually, you can use coordinated noise. So if the noise is added in with some careful coordination and not independently, you can save on the budget sometimes. Let me just take an example. If you want to add as an output, you have a counting query. So you want to know how many users in this database have, uh, have an age of 25 to 30. Then the output will be a number plus minus some noise, the flash of noise. Same thing for the other things. Uh, if you want to have in this case one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different uh, uh, queries, because you want the number of seven. Uh, then you this has global sensitivity equal to one. So each query will need to make sure to use some budget. However, if you treat this as a single query with seven elements, the global sensitivity is still one. Because if you add or remove one user, basically it will change just only one, two of these. Uh, of these columns in the in the Instagram. And so instead of asking different queries, you might ask a single query with a coordinated noise. And in this case, you will save on the budget. Now, this was just a very brief introduction, but it's important that you know that there's there's much more on this. So first of all, if you don't trust the data creator, there's the so-called local differential privacy. So basically, data are anonymized before being updated to the platform. So the curator will not have the, the original data, but will have a local version, uh, will have a locally differentiated version of the data. If you don't want to uh, have queries, but you want to publish data, so publish the original data, also you can do it. This is called non-interactive differential privacy. And it works, uh, but the problem is that we'll, we'll add a lot of noise. Because if you want to, to have the original data table, then it means that you need to add a lot of noise to the rows and columns. If you have categorical value, then uh, uh, there are also other mechanisms that exist. Uh, so basically, you have a uh, not, not anymore a continuous distribution, so you cannot add uh, Laplacian noise, but if you can uh, basically have an uh, exponential distribution, and so deciding which 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 value of the distribution, categorical value to, to extract. And finally, if you assume that the attacker doesn't know everything, as in the classical differential privacy, you can perform a relaxed differential privacy in which you just assume that the attacker has statistical knowledge of the prime, the end prime. And so basically, this is used to not to add too much noise because, again, you don't want to destruct, to, to completely destroy the original data. You still want to extract useful information. Remember the plot of utility and privacy. So for differential privacy, the pros are definitely that is giving rigorous mathematical definition of is quantifying the privacy, while canonymity is just providing you 
some characterization of your cause identifiers. It's flexible, so you can have different mechanism. It's robust to post-processing, so it doesn't matter which mapping function you're applying to your output, you cannot go back. And also, you can choose the level of privacy epsilon. The cons are that uh, the, the precision of the queries is affected, so uh, the output might be very, very different from the true, true value. Sometimes it's hard to explain, even though nowadays is the standard. It's used in uh, many senses. It's also used by, by Google when you, when you are asking for how you see on, on the shops, it says if there are many people now in this time of the day in the shop, it's, it's applying differential privacy to be sure that if, if I'm entering the shop, will not show you a different output. Uh, yeah, then the problem is to, to work. They really need a large data set, but this is not actually a con because again, we want to generalize. And finally, yeah, we have epsilon that we can tune, but what is a reasonable epsilon? And that's a problem because at the end, uh, there are guidelines, but it's completely arbitrary how much, how, it's a quantification, so it's good, but then it's 1.2 uh, a safe value, or it's better to use two or 10. There is, it's not clear, at the end, there's some lawyer deciding, like for the US, uh, uh, serve US um, census, I think that they, they choose like the budget, privacy budget, and the question to 10. It was like completely random numbers, I like, let's say 20 or 100. Okay, and one thing that maybe you're going to explain, I'm not sure, uh, it's also how to apply to machine learning differential privacy. In this case, you can do in two ways, either from the original data, so you add noise to the training data. And then you use you you you, you learn your mapping function, uh, or you can do a smarter thing so you can protect training data in the machine learning model. So instead of applying differential privacy to the original model, you apply differential privacy to the parameters that you learn on the model. And usually the second it's it's smarter because you don't destroy the utility of the original data you protect that against an inference attack. So you have a machine learning model and you want to understand if a user was or wasn't in the training data. In this, with differential privacy, you can quantify the least bound, let's say the, these, uh, the probability of success of such attack. So final slide, uh, well, what if I don't care about privacy? Who cares about privacy? My data is not about privacy, so I don't need differential privacy. Well, actually, again, you need to think that you always want your statistics, unless you are looking for it, uh, it anomaly of some specificity, like you know, your data about credit card fraud, and you want to find anomaly on this data. But if you want instead to perform some statistics, you want something that generalizes, like a machine learning model, uh, these would, shouldn't be dependent on single instances. So applying differential privacy on your data might be also useful just for verification to check if by changing a bit the data, your output, your model is different. The performance of your model are different. Your loss function will change a lot. That like means that in general, you are overfitting because you don't want by changing a single element in your training data your model to be different. So this can be also used just for verification in machine learning model if by perturbing a little bit the original data, you have or don't have difference in the output model. And then there's the last section. I will not go through it. So yeah, to finish better privacy also means, it often means better data. So even if you don't care at all about privacy in your research or, or in your career, Think about these equivalents. So I have some slides about tools for anonymization. I will not present them also because they're boring. If then you cannot really start to code on this. But if you're interested, take a look at the slides later and, and see which, which tool you have to use to anonymize your data or then to directly apply uh, differential privacy on machine learning models.
so let me go to the end to see if there's something else. Yeah, just some credits. So people, uh, I stole some ideas or slide from. And yeah, if you have questions or you want to start a discussion, now is the time. Thanks a lot. Any questions? Here's a question. Um, for differential privacy, it was presented its application considering a database queries and statistical yes. retrieval. A single attribute like name or date of birth would be able to be differential private, or in this kind of granularity specific attributes, it would be no. a key anonymity. As I said in one of the last slides, you can also publish the original database. But in that case, you need to add a lot of notes because you don't want the statistics. You want, in this case, like the, what is the feature, feature like date of birth. You want the date of each single individual. And so in that case, you need to add a lot of noise, not since it's categorical, not the Laplacian and a lot of other noise. But in theory, you can also uh, apply differential privacy to the original elements. Yeah. Just as in practice, if you still want your to be useful, it's better to apply on the output of the query, not on the original data, and then asking the query to the per to the perturbed uh, table. Yeah, but one advantage of perturbing the, the data set itself is then you can freely share this perturbed data yes, set. Yes. And no matter what you want to do, maybe different people want to apply different machine learning models. Then. Yes. Okay, so another question. Some cases we do not want to use these techniques where this anonymization can be. Okay, so definitely, if you want to perform anomaly detection, mm. often anomaly detection will be really dependent on single rows of your tables. You don't really want to generalize. You want to find anomaly in that data, not in other data with the same distribution. So in those cases, when you don't want, when it's not your interest of generalization, you don't want to have statistics. You want to find a single element with some characteristics. Then you, you cannot have privacy because this is completely against. It's the opposite. You want to find one thing in the database, data set. So in that case, it's you cannot really publish data if you if the objective of the data is to find a, an anomaly in, in the in those data. Okay, that's maybe one final question from me. So do, did I understand your, your sentiment is uh, differential privacy is, is stronger than k-anonymity or? It's not always stronger, but at least it quantifies the but, loss of privacy. Yeah, but I mean, in k-anonymity, you have the k. Yes. As a, a, a quantity or a measure. And also, you, uh, if I remember correctly, in one of the slides you mentioned that this differential privacy is less sensitive to the background knowledge. Yes. But there's, I, I always like to think of the extreme case where you have somebody for some reason knows all the features of every data point, including the sensitive features. So there's yes. no way you can you can uh, beat this also with differential privacy. So it's somewhat similar to to K anonymity. It's a technique that that does not. Uh, that make sure you you don't gain knowledge, so you you do not add privacy leakage from the result of this processing, but you cannot say anything beside this uh, data set or also in a machine learning application. Mm -hmm. Outside of of the data set of the federated learning algorithm, you might have somebody who knows everything, so yeah. you can never exclude this. So this differential privacy is also like an incremental guarantee how much you how much you can gain in knowledge uh how much you can gain in knowledge what, what do you mean exactly from 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 looking at the output of a of a machine learning model yeah so in, in this sense it, it's it's similar to k anonymity it's also k anonymity only tells you how much you can gain from this particular table uh yes what with differential privacy what you can do even if you know everything yeah by performing this query, you, you don't know exactly if someone was or wasn't in there. So it's like yes, sure, sure. But but somebody might have know everything about the universe, a higher yes. a higher being, and it, it doesn't matter if 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 this individual was in this data set or not because 
in any case, you know that. It knows everything. Ah, okay, yeah. This I mean. Yes. This I mean, yeah. Yes, okay. So it's, it's always like a, a, a relative, uh, a statement about information gain fr from a certain processing. Yes, you can see it in that way, but we, the problem with the canonimity is that if at a certain point you lose all the correlations. Yeah. With differential privacy, no, you don't lose the yeah. correlation. Because it can limit it then, actually, you perform a can limit it to perform some statistics mm -hmm. afterwards. And if you perform statistics on your data set with a very high K, then it's much worse yeah. than asking the same query and then applying differential privacy mm -hmm. to the query. Mm -hmm. I think that the real more interesting thing is that you are losing less information on the answer of a statistic with differential yeah. privacy with, with K. I mean, okay. In my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, but one advantage that I see about also about k anonymity is this con conceptual simplicity. Yes. You can see it, you can visualize yes. it, grasp it, and um, uh, differential privacy needs probability theory. Exactly. Yeah. So many companies are also lawyer first. Yeah. Sometimes k anonymity too. Yeah. Different. But still, uh, because but, as I said, at yeah. the end, it's still epsilon. Uh, you need to define it at the end. Yeah. Someone has to say if, what is yeah. a reasonable value. Yeah. But but still, I see now more and more that also re regulations and more like legal texts. It seems that differential privacy is kind of the standard. Yes, most widely because used. Because it's the only one that can give you some guarantees at mm. least, or quantification. Yeah. No. Okay. Thanks again. Now there was another question. What's the question? <laughs> yeah. Actually, I just wanted to.